Watch this. Oh, happy Monday. Let's get this week off to a hot start. What do you say, folks? Idaho lawmakers, they started this week early this morning at the State House in Boise, and it's expected to be a marathon week as lawmakers return to take up a handful of items in two big ones, addressing the Biden vaccine mandates and taking up an ethics issue with Representative Priscilla Giddings. We will get to her and that situation in a few minutes. But first, let's talk about the mountain of work Idaho lawmakers are taking on as we speak. They're at the, uh, the Idaho State House continuing to discuss ideas, and those ideas are set to take on the Biden administration's executive action on vaccines. And the Biden administration is looking in part to require private businesses with over 100 employees to require COVID vaccines for their workers or offer weekly COVID testing to track the virus. Republican lawmakers here in Idaho spoke out on the action quickly, saying it's going too far. So. Lawmakers wanted to draft legislation to fight back against what they believe is simple government overreach. So that's why we're back in action at the State House this week. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of ideas among lawmakers. This afternoon and evening, lawmakers are in a collection of committees to discuss their ideas, compare and contrast, and then to vote on what ideas should move forward. Now, House Speaker Scott Bedke detailed to me this afternoon what the rest of today into tomorrow could look like with so many ideas out there. I don't uh, think things will be ready to be debated on the floor until later tomorrow. And uh, the, the committee process needs to needs to work. Now, these are not the most complicated bills that have ever come through the committees. They're fairly simple, fairly straightforward. And, uh, uh, you know, so I expect there to be, you know, involvement. But I don't these are not complicated bills that need a lot of wordsmithing. And so I, I'm optimistic that uh, they'll move through the process. As Speaker Bedke alluded to, today is really about setting up the rest of the week. And there are a lot of different ideas on the table of how Idaho could push back against the federal government. And later this week, we will talk about leading ideas as they do get closer to becoming a possible law. Right now, there are simply a ton of ideas that just need to be fleshed out. So we'll wait for now. Meanwhile, Idaho Democrats are pointing out another layer to this entire story. The Biden vaccine mandates are actually currently wrapped up in the court system as judges work out if the executive action from President Biden is even legal. House Minority Leader Alana Rubel makes the point. How can lawmakers make laws on something still being figured out by the courts? I think that really belongs in federal court and it is being litigated in federal court and ultimately they're either going to be upheld or struck down by a federal court. And so there's really not a lot of state legislature can do on it. You know, if, if the requirements are struck down, no reason for us to be passing laws. If the requirements are upheld, probably any laws we pass are going to be illegal and struck down by a court. So on top of all of this, Democrats in the legislature have concerns about the process the legislature is going through right now. Some argue that the process is being rushed, and because of that, the process is being compromised, they say. I don't see any way that you can deal with 29 bills in three days properly. There won't be time to get attorney general's opinions. There won't be time for the public to have really proper notice of hearings. Um, I guarantee they're going to suspend every single rule there is that's supposed to protect against, you know, against uh, undue rushing, and they're just going to jam things through. Uh, so I have a lot of concerns about what happens from here. I don't know which bills are going to get hearings. I don't know when those hearings are going to happen. I don't know how much opportunity anybody is going to have to read or think about those bills or get expert legal input on them. Um, we're just going to be, you know, they're going to be passing bills with their hair on fire, and I, I don't know that we're going to get a very good result. So I brought this point up with Speaker Bedke this afternoon, and he tells me he hears the Dems, but simply he disagrees. Their concerns are unwarranted, frankly. I mean, uh, and I would uh, urge everyone to watch the process, uh, and they'll see that uh, that we'll, you know, that, that everyone will have their say so. There will be a thorough vetting of the issue by the committee members. They'll put each of these ideas on trial, uh, as they always do in a committee. And, and, uh, and I think that uh, there'll be a, an appropriate outcome on each of them. And then, of course, the committee work will be ratified or not on the, on the House floor and then sent to the Senate, where it will all happen again. So the Idaho House is supposed to take the floor at five o'clock, which just was a few minutes ago. So we believe they are still out there working at this point. But we talked about the House a lot. What about the folks on the other side of the building in the Senate? Well, today they returned to the State House as well. And very quickly, a point was made by Democrat Senator Grant Burgoyne. 
It is possible that a court could rule that lawmakers working right now is improper. You may recall back in May, the Idaho Senate actually formally adjourned for the year. The Idaho House did not. This all created questions about if the Senate is actually adjourned. Some argue, yes, that since they did adjourn, they shouldn't be back right now making laws because they're not legally in session. Earlier this year, the Idaho Attorney General's office was asked for an opinion by lawmakers on the issue. And long story short, the opinion said that because the formal adjournment by the Senate did not receive concurrence from the House, simply, well, it just doesn't count. However, the opinion says in a conclusion that a judge in a courtroom, well, they could certainly rule differently. Senate Minority Leader Michelle Stennett says if this does end up in a court and a judge does disagree with the AG's opinion, all of this could create major issues. Then everything that we've come to do here is void. And so are we spending $35,000, $40,000 a day of taxpayer money that could be put into our schools and our roads and bridges and our infrastructure and the people moving in and all the things that we need um, instead of doing something that might end up being obsolete? And so much more thought, we believe, should have gone into this before we came here. So I mentioned a minute ago, Senator Grant Burgoyne made a point of all of this on the floor, and he actually moved to have the Senate recognize their adjournment and call it a day. In summary, the move failed, not surprising. The Democrats tell me, though, this is an important point that they're trying to get across. And the Senate had a much slower day as they wait for action from the House. The Senate did finish their work for the day, and they will be back tomorrow. Well, there's a lot going down at the State House, and I'm glad we've established all that. We're trying to catch everyone out. And at this point, let's actually head out live to our Andrew Bartline. He's at the State Capitol in Boise. And Andrew, I know it's been a long day there. They're still working hard. I know you were in there. Tell me, what's the feel? Is there frustration? Does it feel like there was a lot of work getting done there? Yeah, so I've really spent most of my day in the House uh, Business Committee, and it's been very long. It's been very drawn out. There's a big turnout for public testimony to talk about the eight bills that the House Business Committee is looking through and discussing. It took two hours to discuss the first one to its entirety, and uh, the representatives on that committee continued to get upset and almost lose patience with people in their public testimony because they had to keep telling them that, all of these bills are about opposing vaccine mandates or pushing back on them in one way or another. So when there's a testimony that says, um, I don't agree with vaccine mandates, that really isn't even a testimony within that of itself. They want to have discussion about the specific language of each bill. So there was actually some frustration there because there's a lot of conversation that actually didn't push anything forward for a very long time. And I've actually heard some comments that Perhaps the House is getting back together at 5 o'clock, but maybe going into recess quickly so they can get back to that House Business Committee and continue to get through those eight bills because it took so long just to get through the first one. We don't have that confirmed. Hopefully right after this show, going inside to get that information to see um, if that committee is still underway. So there has been some frustrations and there has been a big turnout. People are coming to um, you know, pitch their public testimony and how they feel about this. Yeah, Andrew, real quickly before we let you go and get back to work inside, I'm curious, do you see a lot of people inside the Capitol? There were questions about if there'd be interest at 5 p.m. on Monday on this. Uh, I was in the East Wing most of the day, and I would say, yeah, there's a handful of people walking up and down the hall um, in that room where the committee was that I spent most of my day. It was full. There was no open seat, so there are actually people standing outside the windows to peek in and try to hear what was going on. So um, there's been a lot of public interest, um, especially with the House Business Committee. I um, could really only speak to that because that's where I've spent most of my day. All right. Well, Andrew, I'll let you get back to work inside there. Thank you very much for your report here on the 208. Well, also at the State House today, the House took up the ethics complaint against Representative Priscilla Giddings. Now, Representative Giddings reportedly shared the name, photo, and personal information of a 19 year old State House intern who told police that former Representative Aaron Von Ellinger raped her. An ethics committee earlier this year found that Giddings used social media posts and a newsletter to publish the name of the legislative intern who reported that she was raped by one of Giddings' colleagues, Von Ellinger. Now, the Ethics Committee wrote that Giddings, quote, was evasive, combative, and not forthright in her own ethics hearing, and that her decision to send out the 19-year-old's name could convince other victims of harassment, mistreatment, and assault to never come forward. The committee says they also found that Giddings lied. So on the agenda today was how did the House of Representatives of a group want to handle this? Well, lawmakers spoke at length about Giddings' actions and the need to hold lawmakers accountable for their words and actions. Democrat Representative James Ruckty had this thought. We have certain standards here, 
and that when we have a member who has violated those standards, that we call it out. And that we call it out not just for ourselves, but so that the state can understand, our community members can understand, we have standards and we recognize bad behavior. This was bad behavior. It was wrong. The good lady from District 7 knows it was wrong. During the extended debate, Representative Giddings took time to defend her actions and draw attention to due process. Giddings argued that there were holes in the Ethics Committee's process and that she was not out of line in her actions. Giddings said today that she would make the same choices again that she previously did and claimed she did nothing wrong. I will continue to stand up for due process. I will fight for anyone and everyone when it comes to due process. I will continue to fight for freedom in a nation that is slowly losing it. I would not have done anything differently. I think my intent was pure. But I also know that this is so much bigger than me. I know. But nothing I said here today or anything that I have said in the past is going to change your mind. So vote your conscience, and we will move forward, and I will continue to fight for freedom. God bless you all. So after two hours of debate, members of the House did vote. They voted 49 to 19 to remove Representative Giddings from the Commerce and Human Resources Committee for, quote, conduct unbecoming of a legislator. Giddings, though, does remain on a member of the Local Government Resources and Con Conservation Committee and State Affairs. And I spoke with lawmakers about the action to remove Giddings from the Commerce and Human Resources Committee. Some lawmakers tell me that they think it's a weak punishment and a waste. Others say it's sending an important message despite the actual action. It wasn't a very big punishment, really. She was taken off a committee that seldom meets and doesn't pass a lot of bills. Um, and as she said in her own floor speech, you know, she said, great, this will give me more time to do other things. So, <laughs> you know, all in all, it, it was not a very severe punishment. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I think it sent some message just that, you know, the, the body, you know, is active in policing its own and in, in taking action when it thinks that one of its members um, acts in an inappropriate fashion. So it was more of a symbolic than a real penalty, but it was, it was something that sent some message. So the action today should essentially be the end of the Giddings ethics proceedings. Well, it's to help stop the spread of COVID-19 and prevent more unnecessary death. That's why Washington State says they're moving forward with its new mandate as Idaho tries to get out of one. But does more regulation help or hinder? Hmm. Well, you're not going to hinder us by texting in. We want to know your thoughts on everything going on today. You know the number, 208-321-5614. Send us your comments, and you can ask us our questions as well. We'll be reading and answering some of your texts at the end of the show. We'll be back right after a quick break.
Well, thanks for joining us here back on the 208. An interesting conversation that we've been having is kind of about what they're doing in other regions around our northwest part of the country. Now, it's interesting. If you were to take a look at the state of Washington right now, they actually are going after some a little more aggressive, I guess, COVID protocols, you could say. Now, it may not be inside the 208, but we thought this regional update may be interesting to anyone who lives or travels to or from Washington. So while Idaho lawmakers are debating right now how to fight the federal vaccine mandate, our Western neighbor is actually implementing a new idea to try to curb the spread of COVID-19. So starting today in the state of Washington, if you or anyone over the age of 12 wants to go to a large event in the state of Washington, you have to bring your vaccine card or proof of negative COVID cases within the last 72 hours. And this applies to indoor events with 1,000 or more people and outdoor events with more than 10,000 attendees. It doesn't include religious services or kindergarten through 12th grade. So those school events aren't part of this. Washington Governor Jay Inslee announced the mandate last month after a recent surge in cases. Now, health experts say that the virus thrives in cool, dry air, and when people gather indoors, they're more likely to transmit it, especially when they're unmasked. So by implementing this rule, it could help stop a possible spike in Washington as the winter holidays approach. We cannot and we will not surrender to this disease. We cannot and we will not think that the status quo is good enough. We have got to get on top of this disease and knock these numbers down. And that's Governor Inslee in Washington. And according to Washington State Department of Health's website, 73 and a half percent of the state's population 12 or older is vaccinated. And that's almost 20% more than right here in Idaho. The gem state is reporting that 56.1% of Idahoans are fully vaccinated. And this next statistics may come uh, may show that Washington's stricter COVID-19 mandates may be actually making a big difference. This is an interesting thought here. The state of Washington says that 8,934 people have died from COVID-19 complications. The US Census data from 2020 says more than 7.7 .7 million people live there. So that's a death rate of 0.116%. Here in Idaho, and as of the latest data, 3,745 residents in our state have died of COVID since the pandemic began, and our population is 1.84 million residents. So that's about a 0.204%. Both small percentages, yes, but Washington's death rate is lower than Idaho's, even though it has almost four times as many as people. 750 uh, excuse me, 756,962 U.S. residents have died since the pandemic began early last year. Of that, Idaho's deaths are 0.49%. Washington is responsible for 1.18%. And again, while Idaho's number is smaller, Washington's population is a lot bigger. No matter the stats, though, Washington's mandate is in effect. So before you head west for maybe a Seattle Seahawks game or just going to visit the family out in Gig Harbor, or maybe you're just crossing the border to go to one of those great concerts in Spokane, make sure you have your proof of vaccination. It is the law in Washington. Well, still to come for you, it's as close as we'll ever get to having an Idaho Royal and the winning team. Well, they have the lucky one to bask in their presence for a long time. But the king, as they say, it's been MIA for decades. Even now, the search for the crown and the spud underneath, it still continues. We're going to show you this really interesting story coming up. And you don't have to search for our number, though. It's right on your screen. I want to hear from you right now. 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name in the hashtag, the 208. And don't worry, your text will not get lost. We read all of them. If we don't get them to, to get to them today, we may get to them in a different show this week. We'll be right back.
Well, coming up this week, the Northwest Nazarene University men's basketball team will face the College of Idaho in a fight for the Mayor's Cup. It's the oldest college rivalry in the state of Idaho. 92 years and counting, actually. No other rivalry has really stood the test of time like that. When Boise State and the University of Idaho would face each other in football, though, they competed for the Governor's Cup. But the Broncos and the Vandals, they haven't played each other since 2010. Idaho State and the U of I recently reignited their football rivalry in 2018 with the Battle of the Domes trophy. But there is a deeper history between those two schools, specifically in basketball. King Russet, Spuddy Buddy, Idaho's unofficial mascots have resembled tubers since, well, Idaho became known for its potatoes. But at least one famous tater trophy has been lost for decades. His name, King Spud. It's got a face that's, that's kind of winking, kind of leering, and then it's got a crown that's just a, just a little bit askew. It kind of follows you around the room when you look at it. This imitation russet was designed in the early 1960s. And the trophy was part of an effort to try and really build a rivalry game between the University of Idaho and uh, then Idaho State College, now uh, Idaho State University. Uh, that trophy was given to the winner of the basketball game between that uh, rivalry series. And it went back and forth for, uh, we think about 15 years. It was first awarded in 1963, but not everyone thought it was a prize worth winning. You know, a lot of the uh, reactions to the trophy were that it was um, hilariously weird looking. And, you know, so maybe it just wasn't an object that people really wanted to get that competitive about. After losing to the Vandals in February of 1979, Idaho State head coach Lynn Archibald told the Spokesman Review he wasn't upset to see the trophy go. He said, quote, the trophy should go to the losing team, not the winning one. It's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. I've seen other ways uh, that has been described, but I don't know if those are really great for broadcast TV. It was shortly after that. And then it just went missing. We don't know where it is. The most recent sighting that I'm, I'm aware of was in the 1980s at the Idaho State University Alumni Center. That was the last time anybody saw it. 40 years later, the University of Idaho says they still get calls about it, wondering what happened to King Spud. We think it was Idaho State. Um, you might find people at Idaho State who would want to blame us for losing it, but um, here at University of, University of Idaho, we, we think the blame belongs with Idaho State for losing this amazing trophy. And thanks to some pretty creative people at U of I who used only newspaper and yearbook photos to recreate it, King Spud, the remix, is now on display at the University Library. That just amazing strangeness of the trophy that's made it sort of the sticky little bit of, um, you know, niche Idaho history that people continue to be very fascinated by. It's no Lombardi trophy, but it's quite a looker. We reached out to Idaho State to see if they had any idea where King Spud might be, but they said they didn't have any information for us. Ben Hunter, the dean of the Idaho Library, who you just heard from, says that King Spud is part of the Digital Library of Idaho. It's a collection with several other universities and public offices who collaborated to put some pretty cool digital archives all in one place. And we actually have a link that you can go visit in the story at KTBB.com. I'll tell you this, someone knows where King Spud is. He must be found.
All right, let's put the show to bed with some bedtime stories here. A comment from Kelly in Nampa says, Hey Joe, it appears our lawmakers don't care how much taxpayer money they spend. An interesting comment that we've seen a few times today. And I just want to say, I spoke with lawmakers who agree with you, but they say they're using their time at the State House to work on other things for next year's session. So just a piece of info there. Do what you want with it. Brian should be back tomorrow. We'll be back on Tuesday. See you then.